much for this really kind introduction and for exposing me as the nerd I am and how much I love Excel spreadsheets for doing history. Um, and I would really like to thank the Carson Centre for having me here in Munich. Um, all the staff, students and fellows really make the centre a really collegial and productive place to research and write. Um, and thank you for all being here today in this different location. It's a really beautiful building, but to sing out, wave at me if you can't hear me from the back, because um, I don't have a microphone. Okay, I'm getting the thumbs up. <laughs> um, and I've been working here at the Carson Centre since July, so it's really wonderful to finally get the chance to share some of my research with you all. Um, and today I want to talk about some Australian hydro engineering and irrigation schemes that were never implemented. So this is a history of ambitious environmental ideas, popular in the 1930s and 40s, that never came to fruition. It's a history of an imagined irrigated inland. And to start, I'd like to read to you just a few stanzas from a fairly long poem, which was titled Australia Reclaimed, and was published in the Communist Party of Australia's newspaper, The Tribune, in 1945. Though poet, dreamer, and engineer have gone to their last long rest. Their work lives on in a vision clear of a green and verdant west. We must turn the wasted coastal streams, we must fill the great salt lakes, and work on the dams and the hydro schemes till this great dry land awakes. Till the dead heart blooms like a desert rose and the forests rise anew. Till wheat fields, uh, wheat fields wave where the sand now blows and our dearest dreams come true. So this poem was authored by someone calling themselves Sapper R. Waters, and it celebrates proposals to transform Australia's dry inland into a well-watered and closely settled farming landscape. Um, and when he referred to a poet, a dreamer, and an engineer, Waters was specifically identifying three deceased advocates of water engineering. First, there was the well-known Australian poet, Henry Lawson, who had imagined a time when Western New South Wales might be an irrigated and more hospitable landscape. The second person was the dreamer, uh, Frederick Timbury, who was a rugby player, a solicitor, and later the mayor of the Queensland town of Roma, and he also championed water diversion until his death in early 1945. And finally, there was the engineer, JJC Bradfield, who oversaw the design and construction of the Sydney Harbour Bridge and proposed the most famous scheme to irrigate inland Australia. So Bradfield proposed to dam and divert the floodwaters of Queensland's coastal rivers so that they would flow inland into the often dry rivers of western Queensland. Captured water would then be harnessed for hydroelectric power as well as for irrigation purposes. Bradfield also claimed that the above ground storage of water um, in dry regions would increase evaporation and rainfall permanently altering the climate of the inland. And as you can see in this illustration, um, Bradfield believed that irrigation in combination with a cooler, moister climate would transform a large portion of Western Queensland, um, which was generally only used for pastoralism, into a region fit for agriculture, including water intensive crops like rice and cotton. Um, Bradfield's plan gained particular currency during World War II as fears mounted about the potential invasion of Australia's sparsely populated north. But his plan was never implemented. Individual scientists and engineers, as well as government investigations, consistently found that the Bradfield scheme was too expensive and very unlikely to deliver the volume of water or climactic changes that Bradfield claimed. So Bradfield died in 1943, and by this time his uh, plan had largely been scientifically discredited but there remained a large number of inland irrigation fanatics in Australia in the post-World War II years. In dedicating his poem, Sapa R. Waters acknowledged two of these living proponents of watering the inland. So there was Ian Idrius and William Hatfield. Both of these men uh, were travel writers and adventurers. Um, Waters said his poem was principally dedicated to William Hatfield. And in fact, the title of the poem, Australia Reclaimed, was borrowed from a book Hatfield had published just a year earlier. So uh, William Hatfield, William Hatfield uh, was a novelist, adventurer, and by the 1940s, a communist. He published his non-fiction book, Australia Reclaimed, in 1944. And the short book outlined his post-war vision for Australia as a socialist state. 
central to his plan was the irrigation of the inland in order, he argued, to correct environmental damage done since colonisation and at the same time enable more intensive agriculture. So in today's presentation, I'm going to focus primarily on William Hatfield. Large-scale schemes to engineer the Australian um, inland have received, received quite a lot of attention from historians, but most have focused on JJC Bradfield's well-publicised scheme. Um, by contrast, Hatfield has received almost no attention from historians, even though he began to publicly advocate for water diversion years before Bradfield. Um, and sorry, it's a little bit unfortunate that the two have, men have such similar surnames. Um, to be clear, Bradfield is the engineer and Hatfield is the novelist I'm focusing on. <laughs> Um, Hatfield also hasn't received any attention at all from literary scholars, really, um, despite being one of the best-selling Australian adventure and travel writers of the 1930s and 40s. And I think a focus on Hatfield allows me to unpack some of the significant literary following that large-scale water schemes inspired. Um, ultimately, there were far more poets and dreamers among the inland irrigation enthusiasts than there ever were engineers. So William Hatfield is representative of the large number of literary figures who argued, regardless of the rising number of expert dissenters, for the almost unlimited economic and social potential of the Australian continent. Lacking any engineering experience, Hatfield and other literary proponents of irrigation drew instead on their imaginative capabilities and often well-established reading audiences to try and popularise the notion of watering the inland. Um, it was common for these non-expert water dreamers to emphasise that ordinary Australians should not be discouraged by criticisms offered by scientists and government officials. And I should point out here that the, uh, the phrase water dreamers is one I'm borrowing from Australian cultural historian Michael Cathcart. So Hatfield admitted that his plan might be ridiculed by experts, but he urged everyday readers to feel as though they could understand, contribute to, and support these ambitious proposals for the nation's future. Lacking scientific or engineering qualifications, literary proponents of inland engineering emphasised expertise of another kind. They had all invariably resided, worked, or travelled extensively in the remote regions of Australia. So these irrigation schemes seemed to attract the support of popular middle-brow writers who had built literary careers on their adventures in Australia's harshest environments. So, William Hatfield himself was born in Nottingham, England in 1892, and he briefly attended Nottingham University, but instead of completing his degree, he voyaged to Australia in 1912 as a kitchen hand on a ship bound for Adelaide. And once he arrived in Adelaide, he decided to head north immediately um, into the interior of the country, and he soon found work as a boundary rider on a large sheep and cattle station in the far northeast of South Australia. And over the next 20 years, Hatfield did a variety of itinerant work in the northern regions of South Australia, the Northern Territory, and in northern and western Queensland. He was a stockman, a deckhand, an accountant for shipping, mining, and pastoral companies, and sometimes made a living from kangaroo shooting, dingo trapping, and even cattle duffing, uh, which is cattle stealing. So on this slide, you can see Hatfield kind of demonstrating his outback masculinity. In the top left, he's skinning a kangaroo, and in the bottom right, he's a member of a buffalo hunting party. So Hatfield was enthusiastic about launching a literary career for decades, but he didn't have much luck um, until 1931, when his semi-autobiographical novel titled Sheepmates was published. And by 1946, the book had run to over a dozen editions. Throughout the 30s and 40s, Hatfield continued to produce popular novels based loosely on his experiences and adventures in remote regions of Australia. Um, and he also started to produce travel literature. So in 31, uh, 1931 and 1932, Hatfield undertook two long distance car journeys. Uh, the first was a trip from Sydney to Darwin via the interior of the continent, and that enabled him to establish a journalistic career. Um, on the road, he wrote um, short articles back to a Sydney newspaper. And in 1932, he undertook a round Australia trip sponsored by the English Hillman Motor Car Company and the Shell Petrol Company. And these car trips featured heavily in his autobiographical and travel books. Um, and in these travel books, Hatfield really crafted a literary persona that combined his early experience as a worker in the Australian outback with a sense of modern expedition 
And as early as 1931, Hatfield began to express concerns about the environmental and economic situation in Central Australia. And he mentioned the possibility of dams to enable Australia to be more densely settled. By the late 30s, Hatfield was concerned about the deforestation and soil erosion he had witnessed during his sponsored car journeys, which he attributed to poor agricultural and pastoral practices. In the early 40s, Hatfield's concerns had developed a specifically political quality, um, and he began to lecture as a communist, and the communist newspaper, The Tribune, was regularly publishing his ideas. So Hatfield argued that the nationwide popularity of his travel writing in particular encouraged him to write Australia Reclaimed in 1944, which focused entirely on his plans for Australia as a socialist state. It was in Australia Reclaimed that Hatfield published his economic, social and environmental concerns in detail. He argued that in part what was needed, and this is a quote, was a gigantic integrated scheme for the rehabilitation of our arid lands and the basic improvement of the whole continent. Hatfield felt that the large dust storms um, in Australia in the 1930s indicated that white Australia had mistreated the continent. He was especially concerned that sheep were damaging Australian soils. And Hatfield argued, and this is another quote, irrigation must now be used to grow trees again and reclaim the dust bowl. At the same time as he championed environmental restoration, Hatfield believed that with major dam construction and water diversion, large amounts of water could be directed into irrigating the inland for more intensive farming and a much larger rural population. He claimed that when a continent has fashioned a people, an inspiring task faces that people the task of fashioning a continent. So embedded in this quote is Hatfield's kind of preoccupation with both Australia's history and its future. Um, Australia's difficult environments and pioneering history had, according to Hatfield, been essential to the development of a resilient population, which now needed to mobilise, modernise and civilise those same environments. As a result, Hatfield's enthusiasm for dam construction was replete with contradictions. He desired both conservation and development, and his writing was both nostalgic and futuristic. Hatfield often framed his scheme as one of historic and environmental rehabilitation or reclamation. He argued that nature's methods must be copied to restore the country to the state in which we found it. Sometimes Hatfield drew inspiration from the well-watered inland of Australia's prehistory, and other times he emphasised the pristine state of the continent prior to white occupation. Like other inland irrigation enthusiasts, Hatfield suggested that human intervention might enable the recreation of the ancient Australian inland. He drew on fossil evidence, such as that published by Scottish geologist John Walter Gregory, to demonstrate that Australia had once been well-watered and densely populated by flora and fauna. He hoped that Australia might harness science and technology in order to, quote, progress back to the fertility of former ages. Another inland water dreamer called uh, L. H. Luscombe similarly pointed out the prehistoric fertility of the inland. He warned that, like the dinosaurs, Australians might become extinct if they failed to adapt to their environment. Um, but by adapt, Luscombe meant water central Australia by turning northern rivers inland and digging a canal from the south um, to create an inland sea. Um, Luscombe even included um, an illustration of Australia's imagined prehistoric inland in his own book. Um, but the prehistoric past was not the only inspiration for Australia's water dreamers. Just as often, Hatfield talked about the restoration of the pre-colonial Australian environment. Hatfield's travels had, he argued, revealed to him the extensive, done, extensive damage done to the Australian environment as a result of white colonisation, um, especially pastoralism and agriculture. So Hatfield argued, uh, this is a quote as well, to date we have mined the Australian soil, not farmed it. The very size of the land, the enormous wealth to be gouged out quickly, blinded people to all previous conceptions of soil husbandry. So Hatfield raised all sorts of concerns about ring barking and tree clearing, the devastation caused by introduced flora like prickly pear, um, and the damage done to soil and vegetation by introduced animals such as camels, sheep, cattle and horses. According to Hatfield, the environment in the interior of the country had been naturally deteriorating over thousands of years and stocking the land with sheep um, had almost finished the work of nature. 
So Hatfield's work demonstrates that the tensions inherent in much of the irrigation literature of the 30s and 40s. In the same sentence, he could cast nature as an enemy that needed reconquering and suggest that colonial greed and ignorance had caused environmental degradation in the past. And despite his constant criticism of the environmental consequences of colonialism in Australia, Hatfield imagined, uh, Hatfield's imagined irrigated inland was clearly a colonial projection. The dry and economically unproductive inland did not satisfy his imported European notion of how land should either look or act. And like other in irrigation enthusiasts, the central goal of his scheme was to make the inland habitable for more people. Um, inland irrigation literature consistently made really bold claims that an engineered Australia might eventually support 50 or even 100 million people. And colonisers had long believed that Australia would benefit from being more densely settled with smaller family-run farms. Colonial, state and federal governments and private enterprises had encouraged closer settlement on small agricultural blocks with limited success since the mid-19th century. An eagerness for closer settlement was high again in the 30s and 40s because a larger population was seen as critical for the country's defence, uh, particularly after Japanese offensives in Southeast Asia from 1941. And many uh, water dreamers overtly connected irrigation with race. A larger white population in the Australian inland and northern regions was seen as critical to protecting the cultural and racial makeup of the country. And at this time, these beliefs accorded with those of the Australian federal government, whose white Australia policy restricted entry into Australia to immigrants with Western European heritage. So on one hand, there was this overt engagement with race. But at the same time, most of the irrigation enthusiasts did not talk at all about Indigenous Australians or the implications that an engineered inland would have for Indigenous people and their connection to country. There was, however, a kind of creeping fear detectable in much of the irrigation literature, a sense that white Australia had not yet satisfactorily justified through intensive agricultural productivity its dispossession of Aboriginal Australia. If white Australia did not soon justify this dispossession by growing its population and agricultural intensity, some other more populous and productive people, usually imagined as an Asian nation, might move in. Hatfield's own engagement with race was quite out of step with his fellow water dreamers. As a committed communist in the mid-40s, Hatfield opposed the white Australia policy, and he argued that in the post-war years, Australia should freely welcome people of all lands as helpers in developing the continent. Hatfield did remain concerned that if Australia did not make use of the sparsely populated north, another land-hungry nation eventually would but he was kind of willing to see Britain as much as Japan or China as a threat to Australia's sovereignty. Hatfield also wrote specifically about the potential implications of his irrigation ideas for Aboriginal Australia, if only occasionally and briefly. Um, in one instance, he argued that irrigation um, could increase employment for Indigenous Australia, Australians on or near their traditional lands, and in another instance, he suggested that a large swathe of northern Australia could be autonomously controlled by Indigenous people. Um, but despite Hatfield's kind of reasonably progressive race politics for the time, he still explicitly advocated for colonial notions of civilising, domesticating and modernising the continent and its inhabitants. He believed that pastoralism was a stage of civilization between nomadism and agricultural farming. And he argued that pastoralism encouraged a nomadic, immoral lifestyle. Uh, in contrast, the expansion of agriculture would inspire moral, stable families to densely populate the inland. He and his fellow water dreamers believed that the presence of women and families would be especially helpful in civilising and domesticating the transient and independent male pastoral workers of the outback. So Hatfield imagined that his new inland towns would be free from smoke and dirt, centred in a countryside chosen for its fertility in order to provide an abundance of fresh foods within minimum transport. Here, art and education can go hand in hand with science and industry, which would be conducted in smokeless glass brick factories. A new generation can be raised with the best chance of physical fitness, mental alertness, moral stability and aesthetic appreciation. <coughs> 
So Hatfield believed that more so than the country's densely populated coastal cities, these imagined rural communities would give rise to strong, healthy and moral Australian citizens. And in this illustration of Hatfield's vision, you can see below um, the destruction of trees and soil erosion um, and a Victorian city kind of in the top left are being replaced by the image of a young Australian couple kind of admiring a well-watered and densely vege vegetated agricultural scene. So in many ways, Hatfield's was a very conservative vision. His goal was to recreate a kind of idealised English yeomanry on the Australian continent. But his communist politics meant that his scheme had a slightly different emphasis than those put forward by other, mostly politically conservative, water dreamers. Hatfield's communism and his environmental concern were intimately linked. His book, after all, Australia Reclaimed, was primarily his vision for post-war Australia as a socialist state, and inland irrigation was just one element of that vision. He advocated that the large pastoral stations be divided up so that a multitude of small farmers might make use of the land. He was determined to remove the, quote, big men who currently held a mon monopoly over much of the land in the interior. And he accused the pastoral industry of being responsible for the exploitation of workers, both black and white, as well as environmental damage. His scheme to redirect the floodwaters of Queensland would enable the redistribution of land and capital. He also occasionally suggested that he might support the collectivisation of farming. So Hatfield demonstrates the project of populating Australia with human farmers had wide political appeal. But really, regardless of the proponents' politics, schemes to water the inland all looked remarkably similar. They all emphasised environmental improvement, increased productivity, small-scale farms, the domestication and modernisation of the Australian frontier. Another irrigation enthusiast and travel writer, Ernestine Hill, argued that the modernisation of the inland was well underway. Technologies such as aeroplanes, motor cars and radios were a part of what she called the king tide of colonisation. If this was the king tide of colonisation, what Hatfield and others imagined for inland Australia would have been a tidal wave. Not only would large-scale hydro engineering dramatically transform the Australian environment, but according to Hatfield, the morality and physical fitness of the Australian population. Water would enable the physical and moral colonisation of the Australian inland, as well as the political transformation of the country. So, what does this history of kind of an almost forgotten writer and a hydro engineering scheme that never happened tell us? I think first, Hatfield's blend of nostalgia for rural Australia and enthusiasm for its um, kind of futuristic potential captures well the aspirations of many Australians in the immediate post-World War II years. Although it was extreme, Hatfield's utopian vision, which combined large-scale engineering, environmental control, community construction and political transformation, was not altogether out of step with other post-war fantasies. And although Australia's post-war um, Rural Reconstruction Commission did not lend support to engineer JJC Bradfield's hydro-engineering scheme, Enthusiasm for large-scale hydro-engineering projects did prevail, particularly among state and federal politicians. And eventually, the implementation of the Snowy River Hydroelectric Scheme and later the Ord River Scheme demonstrates this kind of ongoing post-war eagerness for environmental transformation in mainstream politics. Secondly, and I think perhaps more importantly, particularly this year, is that there have been recurring, persistent kind of support for inland irrigation schemes in Australia throughout the 20th century, particularly in times of drought or in the lead up to elections and most especially when the two coincide. So in 2019, engineer JJC Bradfield's scheme is again back on the political agenda among conservative politicians in Australia. This year, widespread drought in Eastern Australia coincided with a New South Wales state election in March, a federal election in May, and the beginning of campaigning for the 2020 state election in Queensland. So, um, across February and March of this year, former National Party leader and Deputy Prime Minister, I can hear the Australians groaning, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> National Party leader and Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce advocated building the Bradfield scheme in order to reduce the effect of drought and ensure Australia is, quote, a nation of vision. He also claimed, and this is another quote, 
Every time someone suggests inland irrigation, they get ridiculed by a parade of cynics worshipping the god of inertia, those so whose solution for everything is to put a stick in the spoke, spokes of the wheels of civilization. Um, at the same time, the New South Wales National Party, using the social media hashtag Build the Bradfield, voiced their support for a modern version of the Bradfield scheme to mitigate drought and move excess precipitation from tropical North Queensland to, quote, where we need it. In the lead-up to this year's New South Wales state election, the National Party even promised to spend $25 million re-researching the merits of the Bradfield scheme. Uh, in April, right-wing politician Pauline Hanson promised to use her power in the Australian Senate to build the Bradfield water scheme and drought-proof much of the country. And in September, the current Deputy Prime Minister and leader of the Federal National Party, Michael McCormack, expressed his um, admiration for Bradfield's visionary thinking. And just a month ago, as they prepare for the 2020 state election in Queensland, both sides of politics have evoked modified Bradfield schemes. If they win the election, the Queensland Liberal National Party has promised to be, build a new Bradfield plan, which they are referring to as Queensland's biggest ever drought-busting infrastructure project. Um, and the sitting Labor government has been less committal, but has expressed interest in a kind of smaller version of the Bradfield scheme. So. These political supporters always fail to address the potential environmental ramifications of these projects, which would clearly be immense. Um, nor do they talk about the potential negative effects for local communities or Indigenous groups who uh, hold na native title over some of the areas that would be impacted. Like the hydro engineering proponents of the early 20th century, these contemporary politicians emphasise transforming the Australian continent rather than adapting to it. Um, but, in spite of all the kind of political bluster around Bradfield this year, there seems to, be, seems to me no real danger of these new Bradfield schemes being built. Rather than diverting water, I think these Australian politicians are diverting attention, usually from their lack of significant action with regard to climate change. Even though most of the politicians I've actually referred to here refuse to acknowledge the reality of climate change, they propose these Bradfield-like schemes in order to look as though they are doing something. They consistently position themselves as offering, offering visionary but achievable solutions to Australia's water deficiencies, only to be shot down by small-minded naysaying experts and bureaucrats. They always point to long-dead engineer JJC Bradfield as their expert from history. But politicians don't acknowledge that there have always been non, more non-experts championing the cause of inland hydro engineering in Australia. During the 40s, it was overwhelmingly poets, dreamers, adventurers and travel writers like William Hatfield who imagined a well-watered inland. And while these writers and their texts tell us much about colonialism, race and environmental thought during and after the Second World War, they actually tell us very little about the possibilities and practicalities of water engineering. But in 2019, it seems that politicians would prefer to forget the largely literary and imaginative nature of the vast majority of inland water engineering schemes in order to put them to a political purpose. Thank you.